Thank you very much. Okay, I've been a Drupal developer for a good few years now, but I'm here to talk about a more general design technique that can be applied to all sorts of web technologies, but I will also be specifically discussing how it can be implemented and used within Drupal and some of the advantages that using Drupal lends to it. Okay, before, before I actually get started discussing the technique, I'd like to sort of look back at the history of design on the web in a sort of more general sense. The, the whole infrastructure of the web sprung from very much an academic type setting where which was based pretty much wholly around quality of information and not much thought was given to the, to the design of it, how it looked on screen. For the time, it was good enough, but then people decided to get the idea that they wanted to make their websites look good, and this is where all the trouble started. We wound up having a situation like this, where we had websites optimized for a particular browser on a particular OS with a particular color set, particular resolution, particular time of day, weather. It, all in all, it wasn't a very good idea and it couldn't last. Late in the 90s, these fellows called Macromedia, who developed a an animation tool called Flash, and they had the bright idea around that time that they could use it for web design. And, and some people out there thought it was a really good idea and it caught on. Partic in particular, print designers loved it, as did CD-ROM designers and marketers. Well, boy, did they ever love that. Everyone else, they pretty much felt somewhere between indifferent and livid, but that's beside the point. Anyway, around the start of the last decade, a bunch of web designers started to, started to delve really deeply into the, into the motives of the people who had developed the web, and they thought, thought about how to make things better, how to make things work better with search engines with regard to accessibility, and the, they started to think very heavily about how to shape the future of the web, and they started to advocate very strongly towards having standard implementations across different sets of browsers, the idea being that essentially all browsers would be able to operate at a base, base level that would, be, would have a relatively good set of APIs, and everyone else would be free to innovate a little on top of that, but eventually everyone would be kept at relatively the same level. This was a pretty good idea and it's been about a decade since then and it's slowly been catching on. However, something else also happened in the last decade. People also thought that they'd like to have their websites on mobile phones, especially, especially when considering countries like Japan with the huge proliferation of mobile phones there and in the developing worlds there with the the way more people have access to mobile phones than they do computers. Of course, viewing the web on a phone, possibly a bad idea, will never catch on, but somehow it did. And now we're going to have to sort of own up to having to build, our, build the websites that we've spent so long on getting right on the desktop for mobile phones. And people who have mobile phones like the same sorts of niceties, the same sort of accessibility, the same sort of prettiness that we take for granted on the desktop. We're going to need a few, t few new techniques to be able to do this. We're going to need new tools, new methods, and responsive design is just one of them, but it's potentially a pretty good one. Responsive design covers a couple of base intents, if you will. The idea is not that, not that your website detects the platform it is. It doesn't look for a resolution. It doesn't look for a color depth or a particular browser. It doesn't sniff that. No, instead it responds to the properties of it. It's, a, it's flexible so that it can respond to any set of properties that it's given. The idea is that it should look good and work well across any browser that it it's thrown at. And moreover, from the development point of view, there should be only one version of your site across all your platforms. But 
honestly, I don't think that really sums up the whole point of what responsive design really is. To most, to most of you, I don't know, it might just come across as yet another tedious internet buzzword. And yeah, I totally understand that. So, I don't know, I'm going to kind of look at what it really means. Okay, so you have, look at your, to borrow a tedious internet meme, again, look at your website. There's your website. It's on, on a desktop and, yep, looks, looks pretty good. Look at your mobile phone. There's your website again. And, yep, as you can see, it sort of scales itself to the, to the device and respond, responds properly. Some of the elements scale to be sort of a more acceptable size in a, some of the elements change in a way that's more touch friendly, stuff like that. Look at this older computer. The idea is that it should adapt, adapt to the old system so that it should at least get some sort of base level of functionality. Now look at this tablet. It's your website is on, now on the tablet. It's scaled itself appropriately. It might have some touch specific functionality that looks good and works well. Look at this big screen. The text is slightly bigger. The elements have a bit more breathing room. And yeah, that's more or less intentional. Now look at this billboard. Imagine your website up there. Look, billboard, look, imagine your website on the side of a bus, on the side of a cat. It should look pretty good regardless whatever it's displayed on the side of. That's the whole point of responsive design. Your website responds responds well to your screen, your medium, your cat. There are a bunch of technologies in particular that underpin responsive design and that make it work. These technologies are pretty, pretty much present across every modern browser and even, even some old ones. And, and anyway, there are probably polyfills out there that can help you adapt some of these technologies to older more antiquated browsers. We have CSS media queries, which are sort of help target individual star sheets towards a given set of properties that your browser has. We have fluid grids, which allow your, which allow your website to sort of expand and contract based on the screen size. We have flexible images, which allow your images to grow and shrink in a similar way to similar way to fluid grids. And there's an ideology which sort of underpins the whole thing. It's called progressive enhancement. How many of you are familiar with it? Yeah, nice. Nice. Very glad to hear that too. <laughs> okay, so, so the idea behind responsive design sort of came up in an article on a list apart. It's published, it was sort of developed by a fellow called Ethan Marcotte. And, and yeah, it sort of brought together a whole bunch of different, all those different methodologies that were worked on over the past couple of years and sort of, sort of brought them together in sort of one sort of homogenous, well, sort of homogenous, I don't know, school of thought, technology, ideology, blah, whatever. <laughs> Okay, there are a couple of people out there who are championing it as a technique particularly hard, and there are, there are probably more than a few of them out there, but these were the most obvious ones that I could, I could think of. Now, what can you do with responsive design exactly? You can do a whole bunch of weird and wonderful things, like stuff a collie inside a watermelon and make it fly, but no. Okay, for starters, you can change the sizes of your screen elements as your browser grows and shrinks. So if you say you want your header to header to maintain a consistent proportion on your on your screen as it expands and contracts, yep, yeah, you can set you can set up your style sheets to make that happen. You can also move screen elements around. Say Say on a mobile, you don't want your sidebars to be sitting on the side anymore because there's too little room for your content. Well, no matter. Just, just say remove the float attribute in that case and your sidebars will sit neatly underneath your content. That's one example, but you can also say 
change absolute positioning to say move an element from the top of the screen to the side of the screen or the bottom or whatever you feel like. You can also change the way elements behave. You can do things like use JavaScript to detect detect resize actions in the browser and if that's the case you can can run you can change the way they behave so the different elements trigger different things for example say you've got a top bar at the top you may want it to open in a certain way and you can do that by changing the CSS properties or, or the JavaScript as I've mentioned before and so on you can you can change images and content so that they fit layouts more effectively. For instance, you may want, may want your header image to, say, fill the whole width of the screen when, you're, when it's on your handset, or you may want it to, say, only fill about half when it's viewed on a desktop. You, responsive design gives you enough control over these, these properties so that so you can do this without too much difficulty. And all of this, as I've led before, lead, leads you to be able to change, change the way that content is laid out on your site pretty much completely so that you can essentially maintain a consistent layout on your, on your mobile handset. You can maintain it on your tablet, on your desktop, whatever. And the beauty of it is you're still doing this within one theme. And, and that's not all. You can also swap out images and media so you can find elements that are more appropriate to the device you're viewing it on. You can, you can, you can use lower resolution images on mobile handsets, which means they don't, that your mobile users don't have so much to download, and they like that. I'm not sure if you've been convinced yet why you should use responsive design. There's a, I'm going to go through a couple of reasons why, why you should. Ultimately, in the long run, it's less work. Sure, it's a lot. Sure, it's a lot of work to start with, and will require a lot of thought. But if you think about it, if you think about it. How long does the average layout on a web page last? Maybe I don't know, a year or two, maybe a few more. Chances are there's going to be a whole bunch of new devices coming through, and they're all going to and they're all going to need need to display your website, and they're going to need it well. So if you get it right the first time, then that gives you a lot more breathing room down the track. I think it was Larry Wall who once said one of the chief virtues of a programmer was laziness, and yeah, that very much applies here. A lot of people have argued that there are circumstances which you may need to do a specific mobile version of a site. And, and yes, that is right in some cases, especially where applications are concerned. But that's not necessary all the time. Say you're working on a blog site or a news site or even some classes of applications. They, don't just, they really don't need a mobile app that runs separate from the site or a separate mobile theme might as well just get it right within one theme. Of course, it very much depends on your website, and you need to consider this as you work. And yes, let's face it, mobile users really don't like having less functionality or less content than, than users on tablets, desktops, whatever. Seriously, they hate it. And yeah, you should give them a bit of credit for liking nice things. It does make you popular. If you take your mobile users into consideration, your tablet users into consideration, as well as your desktop users, that's more people viewing your sites, more money coming in, you get to cut the line at parties, etc. <laughs> it is to some degree future-proof. It may not necessarily be completely future-proof. You may need to come back to fix things that happen in, say, Internet Explorer 13. You never know. But, but to some degree, you feel safe pretty safely assured with the progress of web standards so far that, say, the next version of Firefox that's released will at least be able to display your site well. 
that the next version of Internet Explorer will be able to display particularly well, and so on. And like I said earlier, you don't always need an app for that. You, I mean, it's, it's probably a good thing to have the exposure in various app stores, but you know, it might be a bit difficult just trying to develop apps for numerous app stores over and over again. Sometimes it's just easier to get the mobile website right and, and publicize that as opposed to having an app. Or maybe, maybe I should actually change that slide. Consider that, consider that up until now, exclusively HTML5-based mobile toolkits haven't been that great. We've had WebOS and, and let's see, a couple of other mobile frameworks. We've had Titanium and a couple of others. Consider there are a couple of others coming down the pipe that may benefit greatly from responsive design. Stuff like Boot to Gecko and Tizen, for instance, the successor to Migo. Given their reliance on HTML5, I suspect that they will also benefit a great deal from responsive design, especially if they wind up targeting a number of devices with those. And it, I remember there was a, it was sort of a graybeard developer friend of mine. I once sort of explained responsive design to him and he said, well, well, that's really the way they should have done it to start with. Why is it such a big deal? And, it, and it's like, it's like maybe we shouldn't have targeted specific resolutions. Maybe we shouldn't have targeted specific browsers or, or types of de device. Maybe we should have tried to make our websites sort of more accessible pretty much wherever it's needed. Maybe, maybe this is one of the ways we should have done it. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty sweet, to be honest. I think it's pretty cool. However, of course, there are a bunch of potential drawbacks, problems you might have to deal with. I'll just go through a couple of them. It is hard to get started, especially if you've had no experience with it. I don't know, hopefully my talk will be able to clear some of that up. But there are a are plenty of resources out there, plenty of articles that can help you get started. There are, there are a good number of Drupal themes out there that can, that can at least give you a good starting point which you can then customize. But yeah, I under, understand it is hard to get started. It doesn't tend to work on all browsers, particularly because of CSS media queries. I understand that, in particular, Internet, Internet Explorer 8 and below are particularly problematic in this regard. Yeah, let's face it, they don't support CSS media queries, not the way we want it to. The good news is there are JavaScript shims which provide that sort of support. You can do kind of funky things with your markup to force IE 8 and below to support certain style sheets. But yeah, there are a couple of things you can do about making your, making your responsive layout work on all browsers. It is resource in intensive, especially for the developer. You can find yourself maintaining a whole bunch of star sheet files, images at different resolutions. And yeah, sometimes it, it's hard to keep track of things. And you sort of run the risk of fi finding resources all over the place. And, and yeah, you sort of need some good strategies to deal with that. In particular with style sheets, I found like CSS preprocessors like Less and Sass and Compass to be of, of use here, especially since it allows you to sort of customize little bits of your CSS to support support media queries and it builds the style sheets for you and it's very useful. And let's face it, yeah, it's fiddly. Especially when you're when you're building and testing things, you're constantly resizing your browser and you kind of get a bit get a bit puzzled about why that element's moving over there and it shouldn't. And 
yeah, I can understand that it kind of takes patience to get started with this and it may not be for everyone. And there are things you can do to mitigate that, like say, not, not using a fluid grid all the time. You may want to use a couple of different preset sizes. But yeah, there are things that you can do, especially when you get started to sort of help you settle down a bit and feel more comfortable with building responsive layouts. And yeah, like I said before, managing CSS is hard sometimes you, because essentially you will want to be creating different style sheets for particular resolutions. Say your base style sheet, you want to target that towards mobiles. I'll explain why in a little bit. And then you would have style sheets for your tablet resolution, then your laptop, your desktop, your HD, HDTV. Sure, you don't need to cover all of them, but you might wind up covering all of these. And if, especially if you're not certain where a particular rule is being invoked, that might cause you a fair bit of grief. And yep, yeah, let's face it, sometimes an app may be more appropriate. And yeah, I would suggest, I guess, think hard about your project. Think about whether responsive design or an app is appropriate or whether some combination of the two may work best for you. Okay, so I might discuss a couple of strategies how to mitigate these problems. Okay, when you're setting up your style sheets, order of media queries and order of style sheets is very important. So for example, if so for example, your global style sheet may be targeted to media type all, and then you might have different star sheets in increasing order of, of maximum width depending on what devices you're targeting. So it might sort of cascade from mobile to tablet to, to desktop to high definition and so on. Think about how it cascades. And yeah, think, think towards the mobile first. They don't like Mobile users only have limited quota. They don't like downloading too much, too much data. And especially with the state of mobile networks, you can't really rely on it being particularly fast. So, so give mobile users your, your base style sheets, your lowest resolution images, your lowest quality media. Sure, they might not necessarily like it all the time, but ultimately I think they will curse you more for chewing up their quota than they would for giving you slightly lower quality images. It's a good idea to sort of the serious think about how your design will behave, sort of when you're wireframing a site, have a careful think about how it will react to different resolutions, sort of try and wireframe it on different, different sizes if you can, if you have the budget and time. And even so, don't try not to just think about the positions of elements, but also the, the behavior of elements, such as say if you have a dynamic, dynamic bar or form coming in from the side, think, think about yeah, think about the user experience. Think about if you're on this resolution, wouldn't it be better if it reacted in a, in a different way? Requires, yeah, just a little bit more careful thought about it. And yeah, don't forget to account for, for old browsers and so forth. Like I said before, JavaScript shims, very useful in this regard. And you can also use Starsheet trickery and conditional comments to expose certain star sheets to old browsers. And yeah, like I said before, think about whether responsive design is right for your site. Sometimes it may not be. Sometimes it may be exactly what your site needs. So, so yeah, just think very carefully about it. Think whether it's right for your project. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> anyway, by now you're thinking this is a very general technique. What does it have to do with Drupal? I think it has plenty to do with Drupal. While responsive, web while responsive design is a more general web ideology, as 
that essentially means it, it's part of the web as a whole. So, so essentially, what, with Drupal being part of the web, logically it, logically, it and Drupal must have some sort of involvement. And it also means that any expertise you draw from using responsive design in other areas, you can use it in Drupal as well. The technique is transferable. There are already there are already themes out there that support responsive design modules that assist with it, etc. And if we think about it, the way that more people are using mobile devices, you could consider that responsive design is part of the general direction which the web is moving. And given the tremendous success that Drupal's had on the web, I would say that. There's a good opportunity for this technique to go hand in hand with Drupal as a whole. I've, I've even sort of been investigating, sort of looking into the strategic direction behind Drupal 8, and I seem to remember that more people are considering it as being part of the general direction. There's going to be more thought put towards using HTML5, more, more thought towards cha changing the back end for a few other things, but I understand that responsive design is going, is sort of, sort of, I guess, part of the general direction which Drupal 8 is heading. And yeah, like I said before, one markup, one markup on many devices is sort of ideal sort of ideal for Drupal because essentially Drupal's theme layer handles all the markup you only have to only have to build it once and let everything else and let everything else just work. There are a couple of themes out there in particular that are prominent supporters of responsive design. We have Omega, which was covered by the previous Next Guys this morning have adaptive, square grid, responsive HTML5 boilerplate, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, Omega, I'll just be covering a couple of them in passing. If anyone was at this morning's presentation, they would have learned a lot more about Omega. So, and it was a really good talk too. Now, the, now Omega sort of supports a couple of different style sheets which which sort of are invoked at particular widths. You have your default mobile star sheet, small, regular, and widescreen. Your, your configuration settings for your theme can configure the widths at which they're triggered. So if you want to have a particular size targeting a particular resolution, you can do so within the theme layer itself. And Omega also supports a fluid grid so that so that you can make your elements scalable if you so choose. Adaptive, adaptive approaches it just a little bit differently, and it's really interesting. It has separate rules for portrait and landscape displays. So for instance, so for instance, on particular resolutions, you can make it move the columns about to different locations. It has explicitly defined behaviors for multiple classes of devices seems to be able to support grids, but it seems to also be based around regions of particular sizes instead of fluid grids. And yeah, you can also sort of manually configure the widths and positions of your sidebars and other regions. Okay. Okay, well, there are a couple, like I said before, there are a couple of technologies and one major ideology behind responsive design which I'll try and cover as quickly as possible. Okay, our CSS media queries are sort of a sort of an extension of the media attribute of style sheets. It was developed as part of the CSS working group over the over the last decade or so. The idea is normally when you're including a style sheet, you would have a media attribute referring to a particular medium that you want your style sheet being used on, whether it be all your devices or your screen, your handheld, 
whether it's a printout or anything else. And if you're using CSS markup, you can also use you can also use blocks with that at media invocation. You use that same type declaration to specify CSS rules that are only invoked under those conditions. CSS3 media queries means that you can detect a few other features. For example, if you want to detect a color screen, you can expand your media settings so it's like screen and color. That way, if, that way it just won't get invoked on black and white screens. Now, where this is particularly relevant to responsive design is where it is using, it's targeting things like the widths of screens. This is particularly important because if you, if you think about the way the devices are classed, you, you, they, you think about the way you're building your themes, you're usually having a, having a think about how it fits within a certain width. Most people still scroll vertically within them. So, you're targeting your theme at a certain width. So, so what you can do is say set a style sheet for a particular width, whether it be minimum or maximum, and that style sheet will be active, active within that space, if you will. So, if, so essentially, you can override, override the rules of say your global style sheet or other or other rules over a certain width or within a certain set of widths. And, and as you can see above, you can also, also look at things like screen orientation, stuff like that. There are a couple of, couple of things you can use to tailor your media queries, just a couple of Boolean operators, nothing fancy. But yeah, you can also, also look for the features of a particular type of device. Say whether say if you only want certain elements to display on monochrome printouts, you can make that happen. Sometimes you can completely mismatch the features, say in a way that doesn't even make sense. Say you're displaying on a speech device and you're looking for a minimum device width, that doesn't match, so the style sheet won't be used at all. You can also use proprietary features to sort of sort of detect fiddly little edge cases and fix things up within certain classes of browsers. This particular CSS media query covers, covers displays such as the retina display, which has a pixel depth of, of twice, a, twice what it reports. You can use CSS media queries in Drupal in your theme by defining defining it where you normally would define your style sheet media. It works all the same. Drupal's kind of lenient about it, so it will just so it will just set up the media query for you without asking. And so you can, for example, you can use it in your .info file here. You can set it up in your using your Drupal API rules. And yeah, there are a few other resources out there to show you how you can use CSS media queries effectively within Drupal. And yeah, you should, you should also think about, how, like I said earlier, think about how your styles cascade. Here's a particular example I used earlier. You can see how I've arranged them in order of ascending mi minimum width so that you've got your mobile device first and then your small screen devices that going up to your large screen and then your high definition displays. And yeah, the other styles just cascade from one to the other. So, so essentially if you're on say a, a 1024 wide screen, you'll be getting global, the grid and 800.css but you won't be getting any of the others. If you're on an HD display, you'll be getting all of these. Okay, fluid grids are a, are a particular technology which, 
which means that instead of laying out your page in, say, blocks of pixel widths or, or, or anything like that, you would lay out your page to fit a well-proportioned grid. You would set it out in, say, columns, for example. And you can, and with a good grid system, you can set up your set up your page so it uses sort of semantically defined styles to set mm, this element should be, say, four columns wide and have a column of gutter at the side of it. The idea of fluid grids is everything in it is set out in percentages so it can resize with the browser window. Your, your container will fit the full width of your browser window. And it's also built to be versatile across a wide variety of browsers. So you don't need to worry too much about compatibility or anything like that. Yeah, like I said, the elements are defined in terms of proportions. So, so you would set up, set up your wrapper elements to sort of contain all of your, all of your layout and you would set widths and gutter according to, according to percentages. Say like if you're working across a 12 column display, six columns would essentially be the equivalent of 50% wide well, plus or minus gutter, of course. There are a good number of fluid grid systems out there. Uh, one of the most prominently used is 960, but yeah, there are a couple of others out there that will suit pretty much any need that you want, and even some out there that, will, that you can generate on the fly yourself, if you like. And yeah, there are a good number of Drupal themes out there that support fluid grids, like Omega and Adaptive have a baked in, 960 Blueprint, YUI grid, and so on. Flexible images is sort of an interesting technique. They're, essentially, they're proportional in the same way that containers are, so that they change, si they change size in pixels according to the size of the page. You do this by setting the width of the image as a percentage. You don't set the height. And then the entire image just, just expands in height to fill whatever space it needs to. And this sort of technique also works for things like video and any other media you like. There is one major drawback, though. And that, mean, and that essentially is if you consider that you're loading up, say, a front page, say a front page image, or say the main image for a news article, that's going to be, start out being pretty big. And essentially, you'll load, if you're using a mobile, you're going to be loading that within a really tiny space. And one, it's not going to make much sense to have that much information there. And two, it's going to chew up their quota, which they hate. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, sorry about that URL. The slides will be up later, so you can just take a look at it. Anyway, the server can help you, but it requires a little bit of JavaScript magic at the front end. You can, you can use JavaScript to sort of dynamically change the source of your images to point at larger or smaller images depending on the size of your screen. That means you can can get small images when you're on a small screen or large images when you're on a large screen. And yeah, one, one useful thing to do there is to start with a small, small image on a small screen and yeah, phone users will like you because it doesn't, doesn't chew up their resources. And there are a couple of established techniques out there for that. However, some of them are a bit fiddly to implement. Yeah, yeah, Drupal can help you because yeah, image cache and image styles are baked into it. You can five minutes, okay, I'll try and get through this quickly. You can use image cache to your advantage, load sort of define images on the fly and get Java, use JavaScript to pull them in. There are a couple of modules out there for it. Responsive images is one of them. The problem with that one is that it requires changing the H to access to make it work. But there are a few other ways to do it. 
and progressive enhancement. Yeah, it's something that should be, should be familiar for any front-end developer. The idea is that you separate your web pages into layers that contribute to the whole picture. Stuff like behavior and presentation might, might be an enhancement on top of markup. The most important thing to consider, of course, is content. Now, of course, going back to the browser wars, we're dealing with a situation where people just design their sites anywhere they liked it and it wasn't very nice. Anyway, a technique was developed called graceful degradation, which means sort of designing a site the way you like and sort of making allowances for older, not very nice browsers. But yeah, as far as, yeah, that's not the most accessible technique. And in fact, it's sort of a form of lip service and doesn't necessarily mean they get all the content that they should. And it's not flexible enough to allow for new innovations. But the pr principles of progressive enhancement start with, the, start with the content. That's the lowest common denominator. You design your, design your markup semantically. You add features, features and styles for baseline clients. You make sure they're accessible. And then you add stuff on top, whether it be star sheets and scripts, to control presentation and behavior. You start with a content layer that works on all your devices and add behavior layers to give the best experience on modern browsers. And that translates to modern responsive design as well. You start with a design that works well for all devices and make it responsive, make it respond, make it make it have the best response on whatever browsers you like. And of course, Drupal is built with progressive enhancement in mind. If you consider things like the way Forms API and Ajax work and the way table drag and accessibility features work, that stuff's already baked into Drupal. So yeah, they think it's, they think it's a big deal. I do too. Anyway, I put together an example theme for Drupal 7. It's up at that GitHub. I've got an example here. I'll just. Let's see. Might have to might have to jump out of this to show you the way that it responds. Imagine this is your mobile, your tablet, your desktop. It sort of works along those lines. But yeah, remember your templates at the base level, add add your add your classes there. Don't worry too much about. Don't worry too much about adding a lot of funky stuff into the markup. Make your style sheet and behavior layers do that. Think about what your elements are for. Map your tags. All the sorts of things that good themers usually do. Yeah, browser size changes. As as you've seen before, you've seen the way that different different classes. Well, the different style sheets have different media queries applied. Think about how they cascade. Oh, yeah, and, and absolutely don't forget your meta viewport tag because on mobile devices in particular, they sort of like to try and be smart and scale things for themselves. Well, I'm not trying to imply that we know better, but it's usually a good idea to set a viewport, meta viewport tag to make it behave the way you want. But yeah, there may be certain things you want to do on mobile devices in particular, like say move the, move the navigation around so it sits at the bottom of the screen instead. You can do that with responsive design. You can make the content come first, make the logo smaller, whatever you like. I've got a sort of developed a technique in my test theme here, which, which handles flexible images a little differently. I don't think I've got time to cover it now. So yeah, check it out on GitHub. But yeah, ultimately, there's more than one way to do responsive design. And it's still very new, very nascent. So I'd suggest, I guess, check out whatever's out there, play with it, see what you can do with it. Hopefully, you'll like it. And that, yeah, there are a whole bunch of resources out there. And yeah, that's about it. Any questions? Yeah, I'll bring the mic over for you. The um, site that you showed us at respond.blackicemedia.com, yep. is that using a base thing? Uh, no, it doesn't. I built it from scratch. OK, thanks. No problem. Um, 
Do you have any problems explaining these kind of concepts to creatives? I'd say yes. I, yeah, you even have a problem explaining them to, to, to sort of project managers and so forth. But yeah, it's sort of, sort of a new concept for them. They're used to working within, say, a certain set of dimensions. They're sort of not used to the idea that their elements could go all over the place, if you will. But I don't know. I wonder if it's a matter of making them think in terms of proportions rather than set sizes, if that's possible. It's possible. Someone out there does it. Uh, you showed an example before with the uh, grids resizing. Yep. Um, if you were to put an image in there, wouldn't you get that horrible anti-aliasing type effect if you were to resize the page? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that it, yeah, that is a bit of a problem. I think that's sort of something you, you could leave to the browser if you like, but I guess if you're not too fond of that, what you could do is sort of sort of use your image styles, use image cache to load a version of the image that that suits that width a lot better. Okay, one last question. I was just going to say with the um, design stuff, mm -hmm. um, I'm doing the future friendly design talk tomorrow. So oh, nice. if um, it's Sort of this, but how to get in your workflow and start understanding it better for everybody. Hmm. So, just in case, that's not really a question. Sorry, <laughs> that sounds <laughs> pimping. That sounds really good, actually. I have to come along to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right, one last, one, really the last question. Thanks. Last question. Yep. Um, we talk, you talk about a lot about the uh, different experiences you can have across the different platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, effectively, uh, Facebook's probably a good example of that. The, the mobile website yeah. versus the real website uh, actually scales down the functionality. Mm. And uh, while they do it reasonably well, I particularly hate it, but uh, they do it fairly well. They've got a lot of money behind them. Mm. What do you, I, I can envision that there's going to be a lot of creatives and web developers who will make an absolute dog's breakfast of this and piss off their um, consumers as a result. Yeah, what, honestly. What are your response to that, really? Honestly, I wouldn't be too surprised. It's, like I, like I said before, it's something you have to think very carefully about. You need to sort of plan out your user experience on different sizes so that. Essentially, your mobile users need to feel like they're getting the best of both worlds. They need to be getting all the content and functionality out in a very small space. And yeah, that can be a very awkward thing, but also very rewarding. And it is possible, like you've said with Facebook. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it doesn't always work out the way you want it to. Okay, folks, that's all we've got time for. So if you'd like to put yeah. your hands together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you from the team. Thank you.